friends, and I'm going to read a couple poems from uh, my uh, book that just came out in January called Pointed Sentences, and of course I'm selling it too. And if you'd like a copy, I'd be happy to sign it up for you to see me afterwards. This poem is called Four Noble Lives. When Carlotta left me, I cried into my soup. I shriveled into harsh mathematics. A decade later, I was living on Iowa Street with Karen. She had goldfish and good taste. I loved her for her fleshy neck. We drank sinewy dos equis and played mahjong. In March, I developed that cruel facial tick. That precipitated the divorce. At the thought of losing her, my heart contracted into a span. But I knew one day I'd replace her with a brutally neutered cat. <laughs> this poem is called Ferdinand Gets Married. And since I'm an English teacher, uh, there's a story behind it, and it's an illusion. So uh, most of the English teachers in the audience will know that Ferdinand is a character in Shakespeare's, uh, one of Shakespeare's last plays, The Tempest. And in that play, Ferdinand marries Miranda. Yes, Ferdinand marries Miranda. Now, this poem is a series of questions and answers, uh, uh, the kind of questions that a police officer might ask a, uh, might, uh, ask a suspect if he or she is arrested. And that is called being read the Miranda rights. So in this poem, Ferdinand gets Mirandized. Ferdinand gets married. You have the right to remain angry, but anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to your own opinion. If you can't afford an opinion, an opinion will be provided for you. You have the right to be happy. If you can't afford happiness, contentment may be made available. You have the right to consult your feelings but your intelligence may not be present during question. Do you understand these rights? If you understand these rights, say, I do. <laughs> this poem is called Processes. Uh, I wrote it out of frustration of teaching process essays and just being driven crazy by how our flavor. Um, so, processes. Uh, it's in a number of different parts. How to boil water. Get a pot, fill it with water, place it on the stove, turn on the flame. When tiny bubbles appear and grow wild, voila, it is done. How to cook an egg. Read my poem, How to Boil Water. Drop an egg in it. How to eat. Press your food into the hole just below your nose. How to think. Pick one thing, one thing you've been told. Pick this one thing you've been told and pick and pick and keep picking at it until the scab of unknowing falls off. How to love. Sweep into one corner all your ego. Set a match to it. How to die. Watch those who live in your neighborhood. Watch them closely. Copy what they cease to do. Uh, this poem is called uh, Black Squirrel Poem, and uh, it's about Michigan. Without contrition, egregious black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and fracture the crystalline trees. Without conscience, disorderly black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and scratch the ingenuous sky. Without remorse, pedantic black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and spill the upper boulders of the sun. Without shame, incendiary black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and append the tenebrous dust. Without thinking, who trained black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and petrify the involute world? Without regret, audacious black squirrels inhabit Upper Michigan and unionize the local redemption. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm just going to read 
two more. This one's called The Grave of Rimbaud. Rimbaud is a French poet, uh, uh, quite wonderful, who gave up poetry when he was very young and decided to go to Africa and be a gunrunner. The Grave of Rambo. I visited the Grave of Rambo. It was pale blue, like the blood of a baby penguin. Upon its headstone were designs, beautiful and mysterious, like the brain waves of a deer. I touched the grave and found it redemptive, like the law forbidding adultery. I thought I was alone, but I was in the midst of a vast crowd, hissing like poisonous snakes on fire. I'd imagine a grave of Rambo standing out from its field like a single candle on a cake. The grave itself was small, attic, quiet as a king at the end of his reign. Around the grave, the grass was burned, gray and stiff, like the lips of lovers who no longer kiss. I sat by the grave and felt at home, like bigotry in the hearts of men of God. Then darkness settled over the grave, sentimentally, like a kitten on the neck of a man. I left the grave and returned to Marseille, alive like a knife in Adam's apple. And this last one I read is called Axis. I think about the first time you saw an axe. You were in your father's workshop. You think about the first time you held an axe. An older man warned you not to cut off your leg. You think about the first time you sharpened an axe. You held the sharpening stone in your fist. Then you read Aristotle. Poetry is an axe. Poetry is an axe. Then you remember the first time you saw a poem. The first time you held a poem. The first time you sharpened a poem. The first time a poem sharpened you. Thank you.